Welcome to Studio 10 Talks. That guy in front of the marquee of the Franklin Theater is me. I am Patrick Cassidy. I am the artistic director for Studio 10. And welcome, we are here in this incredible theater, on this incredible stage. I wish you could all see it. And we have people out there in the theater. Can you guys make yourselves well known? Yeah! Man, to hear that sound, oh my gosh. It's just incredible to be here again. I wanna thank the Franklin Theater and the Heritage Foundation for allowing Studio 10 to be here. Uh, we have an incredible show tonight because we have an incredible guest tonight. He is one of the inc most incredible directors in New York City. And he, he is the artistic director of his own theater company there, a classic stage company. You were gonna meet him in a few minutes, but before that, uh, I wanna do a little shout out that we need donations. Uh, we survive, as you know, on productions and donations. And right now we can't do productions. We haven't for, for the last year, but we're getting close. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can make a donation by please supporting Just Studio 10 by clicking on the button, on the donation button down there, uh, it's above, or by messaging uh, STT to 202-858-1233. That's 202 202- 858-1233, and we also just love Facebook stars. So that's the shout out for the donation tonight. Please do, it really helps us. It's gotten us to tonight. Without further ado, I want to welcome, uh, he's my partner in crime. I call him my Bo Winkle and I'm Rocky. Uh, Butch and Sundance, Patrick and Patrick. He is Mr. Patrick Thomas. How are you, pal? I am well. And much younger. <laughs> you look uh, you look great this is the first time i noticed i've watched a video you've got a little bit of a beard in the video uh yeah i was um for the first year i was here i was on like the covid sh uh, uh shaving schedule um which was i didn't shave so n now that i now that i'm back and we're, and we're uh, i'm starting to and also summer's coming you know, you, you got you got the beard for for winter and stuff, and it was a great winter. What did you What have you been doing for like the past couple of weeks? Just hanging. Aren't you traveling a little bit? I, I was traveling. Uh, just, I don't even really get mad at me. I, I had my first shot, so I'm very safe. Um, I'm, I'm halfway on the road to getting vaccinated, um, but I was in the Virginia, Virginia, yeah, that. Some, some friends. I was at the first bit of socializing I've had in a, uh, quite some time. So it was really nice. Now, do you have anything for us to play tonight, or are, you, are we going to have hear you later? Are we going to hear you later? That's a good question. I feel like you're going to hear. We, we just had for those of you who are obviously just tuning in and are not here in the theater, we do a little pre-show every uh, every week. So now your new goal is to get invited to the pre-show, and actually the way you do that is you do and then you get to come to the pre-show. Um, so we, we already did some music. I'm going to save the song for a little bit later. Perfect. Great. Great. Um, great. So I'm so excited to hear uh, you know what our guest has to say. I'm so excited. To Talk to God and hear you talk to God. So I'm just going to bow out on this one and uh, let you guys go. Well, we'll see you back because we do have a special little surprise for Mr. John. We'll do that later. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. We'll see you in a little bit. Yep, Thanks so much. Um, without further ado, I want to talk about our first guest. He is a Tony Drama Desk and Outer Critics Award winning director for Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd. Other Broadway credits include The Color Purple and company, as well as Merrily We Roll Along, A Catered Affair, and so many more, I can't even list them. I'll be here all night. He has been the artistic director of four major theater companies and is now currently the artistic director of the award-winning classic stage company in New York. They were in rehearsals for Stephen Sondheim's Assassins, which I got to originate in 1991. It was, it's gonna be the third incarnation in New York City. They are gonna do that again, but they were in rehearsals when the pandemic um, hit, and we're gonna talk about that. Other accolades include the Encore Sondheim and Wynton Marcella stage concert, a bed and a chair at City Center, New York City, Kiss Me Kate at Stratford and Shakespeare Festival, and the visit with Cheetah Rivera. Please welcome, I'm so good, such a pleasure to have him, Mr. John Doyle. John, welcome to the show. You look great. Well, it's the lighting, I think. I've managed to rig something up. <laughs> we all have we all have our ring lights. So first of all, how are you doing? How is New York and how is John Doyle? I'm good. You know, New York's okay. Um, it's a, I spent quite a bit of my life in Connecticut. Uh, I certainly did for a full year for the last year really but i've been coming into the city more and and people are very respectful i'm surprised at how safe it feels i even travel on the subway 
I don't mind it. Everybody's masked. Everybody distances. Who knew? I mean, who knew that New Yorkers could be so polite? I, I didn't know that <laughs> but actually, it does feel it does feel fine. And now that the weather is becoming just a little nicer, my goodness, it makes a difference. It sure does. Have you have you gotten the big V vaccination? Have you, have you the done first that? one, and I get the second one on Friday. Excellent. So that's Excellent. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going. I'm I'm going in for my first one on Thursday. But I also say that I had the uh, the real vaccination, or at least I got the antibodies, the the real or the tough way, in that I battled COVID for twelve days. Right. right. And that was uh, that was that that was a, a strategic uh, little kind of journey that I had to go through. Oh, I bet. Yeah, it was it was not fun. But oh, so many of my friends, John, that have been in New York City during this versus like us being here in Nashville have been traumatized in a way that a lot of people around the country don't know. New York has really gotten hit by like the hardest. I oh yeah, I mean, I, I live up on 63rd on the east side and you know, I'm right beside all the hospitals here and at Mount Sinai and Roosevelt, many of them are around. And you know, you saw the the trucks in the street that were taking the holding the bodies. I mean, it was, uh, it was fairly uh, epic stuff really. But you know, for all for all that could be said for or against the um, the governor at the moment, uh, he he did do a, a wonderful job of of uh, I think anyway of of keeping people's spirits up through it all. Uh, pretty impressive stuff. That's 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 great. And you know, there's nothing like the resilience of New York City. Nothing in, like it. in every way. So I want to go back with you because as much as I'm so honored to have you here as a guest, I'm also just lo going to love this hour getting to know you. Uh, you were born and raised in Scotland, yes? I was, I was I was born in Inverness, which is in the highlands of Scotland. So it's kind of, for anybody who knows the island, it's quite high up on the island, uh, in the most beautiful part of the world. I mean, I didn't think it was beautiful at the time. I couldn't wait to get out of it, but <laughs> I go back now and I think, why did I not stay here? I think the reason I didn't stay there is because there was no theater of any description, But um, but it was beautiful. That was my that was my next question. Question: What was the theater like in Scotland? More importantly, growing up, what was the musical theater like? Okay, I mean, you know, there was no. I didn't see a professional play or a musical until I went to theater school. Until I went to drama school, I did go to drama school quite. I, mean, I was only seventeen, but um, but there was very very strong community theater. I mean, being quite remote as a part of the world, um, there was a strong, you know, we called it the Inverness Opera Company, but they were the community theatre company who did musicals every year. And I, as a 15-year-old, I got myself involved in that. that. Well, that was really my first experience of seeing any theatre. I saw things like Rosemary and the Desert Song, things that, thank God, nobody does anymore. <laughs> and then... I, I was in a show. Um, I was I played Og the Leprechaun in Finian's Rainbow. Oh, that's a good part. Even it though they is. they don't do Finian's Rainbow very much anymore. Well, they don't, and that's probably no bad thing either. Yeah. Um, but you know that sort of got me interested. I think. But I, I think church was a much bigger thing than theatre. To be honest, I mean that's what you know. Everybody went to church. I was intending to go to Aberdeen University to read divinity to become a minister. And went to drama school instead, and and I now see they're not. It's not so very different, to be honest. Being a theatre director and being a minister of a church is not. A, or, not or, or being a lawyer, all yeah, the same. All the same thing. But no, there, there really was nothing. And I went. I went to the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama in Glasgow, which is a, a school of pretty high reputation. And um, and I I had a wonderful three years there. And started to see theatre there. That was in Glasgow. And there was a company called the Glasgow Citizens Company who did very, this was in the early 70s, but did very cutting edge classical work. And I started to see theatre that way. And then I came to America and I studied uh, in, from, I did a must, my master's at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Wow. I know, of all places. Wow. That was a very different world. I mean, A, it was a different world to Britain, that's for sure. I mean, I'd never been to the States. And it was even a different world for America, you know. I mean, sure. it's 90, the early 70s was not so very long after desegregation. It was very interesting. 
Uh, so you went from Scotland to Atlanta to Georgia? To Athens, Georgia. I did it. I, I, I was very fortunate. I, I won a quite big lucrative scholarship, which paid for everything. Otherwise, I would never have been able to do it. My family didn't have any money. Um, but I had to come into the, I had to pay for my own travel. So I got an Air India flight, which was the cheapest way you could fly in those days, right. um, into what I now realize was John F. Kennedy Airport. Somehow got across town, I don't know how, got to what I think must have been the old Port Authority building, never having been in New York City. You know, I was, tw I was 20. Yeah. And then I got a Greyhound bus uh, to Athens, Georgia from New York. And, you know, it was an extraordinary experience because I was the... I was the only white person on the bus, all right? Now, I want you to bear in mind that I had never, ever met or spoken to a person of color. I came from Scotland, right? <laughs> it's totally white. So, right. like, to be on this bus as the, as the, as the minority um, and, and how, and not to know how to behave was really fascinating. I mean, it was extraordinary years and years and years later to direct The Color Purple on Broadway for that very reason. I mean, that was like um, a, I'm sure, yeah. a huge, a huge, a huge journey. journey. Yeah. Did you, were you ever, um, I mean, you said a little bit that you've done Finian's Rainbow. Were you ever an actor, interested in being an actor? Yeah. Or Not really. I, my training was more as a teacher than as an actor. I, I suppose, like, in my generation, every young man who went to theater school thought he might be an actor. But I, I didn't really have any strong ambition about being an actor at all. And I don't know that I wanted to be, an, I don't really know. I, I, don't, I don't think I knew what a director was, to be honest. I mean, you know, I think it was, I thought it was the person who told people where to stand. Uh, you know. um, so, and the choreographer tells people where to dance. Yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't really know. And then I went back to the UK having studied in Georgia and, uh, I did a little bit of acting for about a year, but that was all. I, 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 it, I didn't enjoy it particularly. I don't think I was dreadful or anything. I just think I, um, I enjoyed the rehearsals. I enjoyed the rehearsal process, but I didn't enjoy the eight shows a week. I didn't enjoy, I didn't enjoy the repetition. Uh, I enjoyed the actual rehearsal process, which I suppose is why I'm a director. I, I asked this question and have of many directors. You know, Hal Prince, James Lapine were both also not actors, right? Um, do you think that is an that it's an advantage to being an actor before becoming a director, or not? Or do you think do you think it's helpful, or or does it really matter? Um, I don't think it really matters to be. Well, I mean, they've not done badly, and they weren't actors, well, so they have. <laughs> I don't think it matters. You know, Peter Brook wasn't an actor, and there were many. Uh, Peter Hall, Trevor Trevor Nunn. I don't think he was an actor. No, I, I, I don't think it matters much, but, but I think what, what I value from the year that I did do some acting and I also did some stage management, you know, just to get, get weeks on my equity card, as you had to do in those days, um, was the understanding of that artist's process, the understanding of what that person needs. I think that was helpful in terms of being a director. But, you know, I'm not even sure that... I'm not even sure that training is, I mean, of course that's helpful to a director because a training for a director uh, gives you some context, but I do think it's a skill that you're, it's a little bit like being a psychologist, you know, or being a psychiatrist. I mean, it's something that you're either able to do or not. I mean, I was, I was an only child, spent a lot of my, t I, perfectly happy only child, but I spent a lot of my time in my imagination. Yeah. Uh, um, and I, had, both my parents are dead now, but they they they, they, they didn't have the most smooth um, relationship, and uh, so I was the kind of mediator of the house. I was the peacemaker. I was the person who made it okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's what that's part of what made me a director. I was able to I was able to negotiate tricky situations and bring out the best on, in those. So I think. I think life experience is the thing that makes you a director more than anything. Tell me, for, for our audience, and I, I, I love to hear this. I've, I've heard so many people talk about it. 
Talk to me about how the British actors are trained versus how the American actors are trained. Okay, well, you know, the the greater percentage of British actors, maybe not so much now, but certainly up until the last 10 or 15 years, went to theatre school as opposed to university, all right? So they went to a conservatoire training where you spent, as I did, every day, you know, you had speech lessons, singing lessons, movement lessons. You weren't, it, 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 the education system was different. You know, you didn't have to do so many credits in, in the sciences bef- and then go and do your, your theater training uh, as another part of your degree. Uh, you really are, you're, in Britain, you're kind of specializing from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And the, the teachers who work at a lot of those conservatoires, we'll call them, are really extraordinary. You get an enormous amount of practice. You are in, you know, you do many workshops for a year and then you're in plays every year. It's a huge amount of practice. It's very practice orientated. Now, I think what's good about the British system is that they they also help students to know how to work within the profession. They, they help you out into the profession. I mean, no, I didn't know what signing on for unemployment was. Well, you certainly need to know what that is, you know. So uh, I, think, I think the training is more practical, more hands-on. And I think the, um, I've, I've always been very interested in, I, I don't know if this comes from education or not, but in America, actors are very well behaved, right? So as a director, Actors come into the room, they very seldom challenge you, uh, which I find frustrating. But they because I'm used to I'm used to actors in Britain saying, Oh, wait a minute, I don't agree with you. You would very seldom hear that in an American. Well, I don't agree with you at all with anything you say. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. And so I like I like actors who um not who combat with me, but who uh, where, where we can have a real tussle about how to make a piece of work, which is why I've loved working with people like, I mean, I've been very lucky, but working in America with people like Patty Lapone or, you know, you, she's not going to let you off with any nonsense. And I, think I like that. I enjoy that. Um, so, the, so it's a more rigorous uh, study. However, the, um, the, 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 what, I, what I really like in America is there is a much stronger work ethic than I'm used to seeing in Britain. At, at, at heart, I think, yeah, there's something kind of, I, I should, don't ever, I hope not, not too many Brits are watching or listening, but there's something slightly lazy in the British actor that is not there in the American actor. The American actor works extraordinarily hard, and uh, I, I like that a lot. Wait, forgive me, this is the BBC. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I mean, it's it's because I would think, you know, in a working class system, and 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 again, the technical aspect. One of the things that I was I was thinking about in terms of again the training is that the American actors, you know, Stanislavski, the method, Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, all that stuff wrenching at your guts, yes. which is not taught in the British system no. at all. No, it's not really. We don't do. Uh, well, maybe this is changing, but we don't really do what's called table work or deep thinking. It's much, much more the first day you're on your feet. You know, you get on with it. I, I like that. I don't do any do. table work in America either. I, I get up, do it, then you'll discover more about it. I think another interesting thing about the British system, which has changed a little bit. In my generation, you know, as a boy coming from the highlands of Scotland whose family had no money, um, I, I had an entitlement, that's an awful word, but I was entitled to four years of university education or college education, however you want to put it, free. Mm. So everything was paid for. So I didn't, you could go to school and study and you weren't worrying about the debt building up or your family couldn't afford to do it or any of that stuff. And I think that's what gave birth to a whole generation, particularly of playwrights, mm. what the British call the angry young men, you know, or actors like Albert Finney, um, John Osborne, all those writers who were all uh, uh, Alan Bennett, 
who were all working class boys or girls who probably today would find it much easier, much more difficult to get a start because they would have to pay for their education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a socialist government. So, it, and a socialist, not just a socialist government all the time, a socialist mentality. So the, the notion that you, you had the rights in the same way that you have the right to a, a health service, um, it, it, it's just a different way. And, and I think that gave opportunity to people who may not otherwise have, have had opportunity. I am certainly one of them. I would still have been in Inverness had it not been for that opportunity, for that educational opportunity. Well, um, I think both of us need to uh, pay respects to a man who turns 91 today. Mr. Yes. Happy birthday to him. I know. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, it, and I know, and I, I want to talk to you, to you now because you, wow, your your work with his material has been unprecedented. I mean, you have directed how many how many Sondheim shows have you actually directed? You know, I'm not sure. I, uh, okay, let's just very quickly go through Sweeney Todd twice, actually. Uh, Gypsy, twice. Uh, West Side Story, once. Anyone Can Whistle, which is almost never done. I did the, the European premiere of that. Merrily We Roll Along, I've done twice. Uh, Passion in New York, once. Pacific Overtures, uh, Assassins Now. Uh, Roadshow, which was... The show that was called The Bounce, which I and, saw. And Wise Guys, wasn't it also? Wise Guys. guys. And yeah. they, they kind of lost their way with that. And I um, I did I did that with, uh, sort of brought it to where it is now with, with John Weidman and Steve Sondheim. Company, of course, on Broadway. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky indeed. Into the Woods I've done. So I suppose I have done the great, I've not yeah. done. I've Follies not done Follies. Little, Follies. Follies. I've not done Forum and I've not done a little night music. Oh. Um, uh, I would love to do Follies. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, I'm not sure I love the music of a little night music, but my my taste or tendency is to try and go into a room and reinvent something. And I'm not sure you I don't know that you can reinvent a little night music. It's so beautifully, perfectly what it is that I'm not sure. I think I might just mess it up. Really. I, I've done it. I've actually done uh, Frederick twice. And I did it once in more of a sort of a chamber version where there were only uh, two uh, uh, Liebes leaders and, and, and five musicians on the stage. Wow. And it's, which I know you understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, it was, and it was quite fun. And then I've done it I did it at AC2 with, uh, with a big orchestra in that way too. Yeah. Um, so everybody talks. I'm, I know you've been asked this question a thousand times. Uh, if you want to put put a different spin on it for me and for our audience, great. So you have been known to take actors and have them play instruments on the stage. I had read somewhere that it was a, a great way to save on the budget when you were coming up, right? <laughs> Where and and um, and also the minimalistic sets that you you design. And talk to me though about this this thing and, and the and the casting of it i'm i'm very interested to know how you cast an actor you okay. cast a great actor a great singer and then a great musician okay well i didn't i mean the the the, the notion of actor musicianship as they call it now right and and you know it's now taught at colleges and there's a college in london called the rose bruford college which is very well known and i'm a fellow of the school because of that uh, you know an honorary degree in in the notion of actor musicianship it, it the the term actor musician didn't exist uh, before i came along i was in the very pub where we created the idea but uh, but the notion of actors playing instruments did um in a in a different context mostly rock and roll musicals mm -hmm. pieces like buddy um yep. return to the forbidden planet uh, you know, there was a there was a sort of three chord Jerry Lee Lewis type. Uh, you know, many many actors can play the guitar, so uh, so that was be that was becoming used, it, coming into the kind of rock and roll musical a little bit. I had done a, a whole series of musicals in regional theatres, where you know I was doing. I, I remember doing. The last one I did actually of those was a Sweeney Todd, which was really a small scale version of Hal Prince's original production, like we do, you know. 
and I, I got a bit fed up of doing that kind of work. I thought, there's something wrong. I need to find my own way. So I stopped doing musicals for about four or five years. Was running a theatre, was leading a theatre in Liverpool uh, in England, which is very much a, theater, a city of music, of course, the Beatles being a, a manifestation of that. Um, and my board said to me, we brought you here because you do musicals and you haven't done any. And I said, well, I don't really want to. And... <laughs> and you can't really afford to do them. Uh, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. And I and they said, oh, oh come on, you can do something. So I thought, okay, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll embarrass you. You know, I'll do, um, I'll do Condit. I'll do Bernstein's Condit. That's something I'd like to do. Let's see if we can do it. Thinking we'll never be able to do it. We could only afford to employ 12 actors or 12 musicians, but not, not both. And so I put, I thought, okay, well, maybe I can transfer the kind of rock and roll style into Candide. Maybe I can find an actor who can really play the trumpet well. Maybe I can find an actor who can play the clarinet well. Not thinking that they would have to play that extraordinary overture. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I talked myself into a corner and ended up doing it. I can remember the first rehearsal of the overture and thinking, I, 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 in those days, I used to drink alcohol. And at the end of that Saturday, I just went home and got drunk because I thought, this is never going to happen. This show is never going to happen. Uh, it was so bad. But eventually, it, it did work out OK. And there's something that happened in that particular. It, it, toured, it toured Britain for a year, won awards, blah, blah, blah. Um, but something happened in the, in the rehearsing of that piece that made me see act, why why only an actor can be an acting musician. It's not so easy for a musician to be an acting musician, right? Because you have to come at it from an actor's mentality. Mm -hmm. Questions that are asked are the same as an actor. The woman in Candide, if anybody knows it, the woman with one buttock, the actress who was playing that part, um, she to play the tim timpani. And she never played timpani in her life. And it's not as easy as it sounds. You know, you don't you just, just bang something. But she didn't pay the tips, you know, and she kept going off rhythm. And I thought, what can I do to get her to stay in rhythm? So I said, okay, could you, do you knit? She said, yes. I said, all right, let's make the old lady, as the character is called, let's make her knit. And every fourth stitch, you hit the, um, you hit the timp in the overture. And she could do that without any trouble. She, she never went out of rhythm again because she was thinking of it like an actor. It was an activity rather than having the stress of being a musician. And that became, that was sort of the beginning. In those days, you know, they still sat on chairs, played their instruments and then got up and acted and then sat down again. And then I worked through workshops and other productions in other theaters, many of them. By the time Sweeney Todd came to America, I had done like, 30 shows with acting musicians, um, uh, developing the skill, developing different ways of how to do it, how to, uh, you know, the musician's mind, I think it's fair to say, starts from a place of excellence and the actor's mind starts from a place of chaos, right? And the actor gradually meets excellence yeah, and they meet in the middle eventually. But when it's an actual musician, the, act, the, the human being has to have both. The, it's like the right and the left side of the brain are working in conjunction. So it's a very interesting form altogether. But it did, it actually really, really did start because of lack of resource, as has the, um, as has the design work that I did. I mean, that it, people call it minimalism, Patrick, and I'm not sure about that really. Um, but certainly I've developed a way of working that is, uh, about it's about asking the audience to use its imagination. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, and producers must love you. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. I mean, Sweeney was interesting in that it when it came here, really people hadn't seen anything like it before. Um, and what happened was it was done in London. It was done in a tiny regional theatre. First of all, with 120 seats in a stage that was 14 feet by 14 feet tiny and then it got picked up went to london played for a year stephen sondheim who you mentioned earlier on came and saw it gave his uh, approval of it coming to new york 
I thought, oh my God, this is terrifying. You know, I mean, this is like taking a musical back to its roots when what I had done, Sweeney Todd was done with nine people at that point, we had 10 on Broadway. Um, so challenged the form, I thought I'm going to be absolutely hung up for doing this. Um, and But he was incredibly supportive. He was, he he stood by it all the way and, and was there for me all, all the way. Uh, and that was extraordinary. And then, of course, what was interesting in that was, you know, that, that kind of work up to that point had all been done by ensemble actors. There was no star name. There was mm -hmm. no, nothing like that. It was just like a like a family of actors who had been growing up together making this kind of material. And, of course, you know, if you're going to play something on Broadway, the, the, the finances are entirely different. So they said to me, oh, well, you're going to have to have two names in the leading roles. And I thought, God, I mean, that's the antithesis of what this is all about. I met Michael Cerverus. He was the first and only person I met. Uh, and I thought, though, this, this man, and I, I found out that he was a musician, but I, I thought, no, he must play Sweeney Todd. I, there was no question in my mind. And then they gave me, I saw virtually my entire CD collection of women. Um, and that's how Paddy came to do it. Uh, well, let me, sh let me show you. I have a clip for you of Michael and Patty and John Doyle's Sweeney Todd, for which he won the Tony, the Drama Desk, and the Outer Critics. Take a look at this. These are my friends. See how they glisten. See this one shine. How he smiles in the light. My friend, my faithful friend. Rest now, my friends. Never you've seen a long hold you. Wow. Wow. Good. Uh, they were both great. Um, and Patty played the tuba, right? Is that he correct? played the tuba. Yeah. When we met, we, we met in Portland, Oregon, of all places. I had to fly in, meet her there, and I had to fly out the next morning. And she, she said, oh, I can play the Sousa, uh, the Sousa phone, which is that great big instrument that you go inside, you know, it wraps around oh, you with your horn, you know? And I said, you're not getting, if you if you get this job, you're not playing that. Because I thought that's just like a big gag, you know. But actually, she played in high school band and, and she's of course very musical. And she did indeed play the tuba. I mean, there's no question she did. But, and she played bells, you know, the uh, xylophones and things like that all the way through it, which is not easy. I mean, it sounds easy, childlike, but it, it's not. And the, the musicians were extraordinary. Alex, Alexander Gimignani, whose father, Paul, you know, um, yeah. He kind of led it in a way. Manuel Felciano, who was Tony nominated, he played Tobias, and he's a he's a, a beautiful violinist. So there were there were some great players. Oh, that sound that you just heard is all them. I mean, there was no there was no backup or somebody in the wings or something. It was them. Well, I had I I got to see. I didn't get to see Sweeney, but I got to see Company. It was the same thing. I mean, I they, there they were, and and you saved. I love that that you, that Raoul did not play until until being alive, and I thought it was just so beautifully, and it really affected me so much. You know, you you were quoted as saying that when you first saw Company, that you thought you understand, it, you thought it was you, or you you really understood it, you related to it. To yeah, you know, yeah, it's it's actually not when I first saw it years and years ago. A, a, a close friend, she gave me. Uh, 
a, a, a little cassette tape recorder. You remember those? You know that yeah. you used to put in a little cassette tape recorder. Uh, a tape recording of this musical by this man called Stephen Sondheim, who, to be honest, wasn't really on my radar. I mean, this was in the 70s. And um, I mean, I suppose if I thought about it, I knew he he wrote the lyrics for West Side Story and Gypsy, but it wasn't really in my radar. And um, I listened to it and I thought, oh, my God, this, this man is writing about me. I mean, uh, uh, what terrible arrogance. But, you know... <laughs> I think the thing I think the thing in company that I was so struck by and it's it's always struck me is the notion of the person on the outside looking in you know he actually says I've I'm I'm looking in at my friends I'm I'm not uh, I'm not with them I'm watching them I'm always on the outside and as a theater as a director of course you're on the outside I mean you can you can be in the room with everybody you can be enjoying everybody but you're still that's your job to be objective about what you're seeing in front of you and I think being an only child that affected that too lots and lots of things about company that that I felt were kind of me and I didn't Sweeney Sweeney Todd was on in London and was about to come to Broadway and a, a regional theatre director from America who's no longer with us sadly a man called Ed Stern who ran the uh, Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely man. And he came uh, and saw, saw Sweeney in London and he got in touch with my agent and said, would I meet him for lunch? And I said, sure. And so I met this man and he said, would I come to Cincinnati and do Sweeney Todd? I said, no. I said, it, it might go to Broadway. If it did, that's great. And if it doesn't, I don't mind if I never see it again because it's driving me crazy. Because, you know, it, it's not good for your headspace that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And he said, well, would you do an, another Sondheim? You come and do another Sondheim in the same kind of way. And I said, well, maybe. And by this point, I knew Steve Sondheim. And I said, what do you think? I've had, I got this invitation. Um, I, I like this man a lot. So I'd like to go. I don't know if I want to go to Cincinnati, but I really like him. So I'd like to go do it. He said, well, a little night music's the obvious one. You know, there's already a boy who plays the cello, etc. But he said, I think you should do company and you should do it with acting musicians to see what happens. And it might actually give the piece a sort of glue in a way. It might create a reason for everybody being on stage all the time. So off we went. And, you know, that was an extraordinary cast. Barbara Walsh, Raoul, wonderful, wonderful people who probably would never have gone to Cincinnati, Ohio and done company had I not just won the Tony. You know, I mean, that's right. how it works. Um, and, uh, we, uh, but we didn't know, we didn't know it was going to go uh, to Broadway or anything. It was just simply for there. And uh, various Broadway producers came on the opening night. I can remember now one who shall remain nameless sat, stood in the lobby with me and said, I would like to take it to Broadway next season. We we will change. We'll give that. We'll get this famous person to do this role and this other famous person to do this role. I said, wait. I said these actors came to Cincinnati, Ohio, in January to do this piece with me, and you either take them all to Broadway or you're not getting it. It's not happening. Good for you. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, and it won the Tony, actually, which was lovely. It won the Tony for Best Revival. Um, but it was well, it's, a, it's a special piece. I have a I, I got to do it uh, when I was thirty five with Carol Burnett playing Joanne, and it was and it was quite and I and and I want to show a clip from it as well. Uh, in the last song that Bobby has to sing, which I actually sang some some of it tonight for our audience. Um, what tell me what tell me what you think he's saying in that song uh, in being alive um well i th i i think before i can answer that question i would i i think what what we also did in that production and that i did which was the first time it's been sung on broadway was uh, Marily, uh marry me a little which comes at the oh. end of that one and i think they are two kind of bookends but marry me a little, love me just enough, is so much on his terms, right? Uh, like, he, it's controlling. 
Mm -hmm. Being alive is not controlling. Being alive, probably for the first time in his life, is his vulnerability. Is, is him saying, "I will, I will try to join the dance. I will try to be with everybody, and maybe that way I'll learn how to be alive, how to truly be alive." I think that's what it's about, and that's actually why. In in, in the, the, my production, that's why Raoul didn't play until that point. You know, he was in a in a room full of expert musicians. He's a wonderful singer, but he's not an expert piano player. Uh, and and I I had I did not plan that he would be playing. Um, and I said to him in the rehearsal period, I said, "Do you play the piano?" He said, "Well, a little bit." I said, "Well, I think you should play." Thinking that way, you'll be. You should play the beginning of being alive. You should go to the piano, this piano that's sitting in the middle of the stage like a status symbol. You know, all those people who have, who have Steinways in their houses but don't play. Uh, you, you should just go and play and see what happens. And, and it, it made him afraid. Um, and that sounds manipulative. It, it wasn't. I love him dearly. But it, it, it was about... I needed Bobby to be afraid. I needed that that character to be afraid. Well, this let me did. show the end of this clip. And if you haven't seen this whole clip, please go to YouTube. Watch John Doyle's Being Alive. Watch Ral sing this song. This is the end of Being Alive. Yeah, he That's... really, he really should have won the Tony. I mean, there's nothing in those prizes. It's all nonsense, really. But, but he, he should have. It was well, a remarkable performance. That song, I've never, I've actually never, I've seen it done a lot. I've sung it myself. I've never seen it better than what he did. I oh, no, he, it was extraordinary. And every night he did that. I mean, he laid himself on the line with it every single night, including in Cincinnati. I mean, it wasn't like that was him doing his Broadway gig. You know, it, it was, it was quite. Quite something, really. A very I have, happy company. I have so much I have to talk because I want to get to Assassins. Um, Color Purple. Cynthia uh -huh. Erivo. Uh, what a talent. Mm -hmm. What an incredible talent. Uh, you brought her over from the London production, right? And I would did. you have brought it here in New York without her? No. Here, New York. I wouldn't. I don't blame her. No. And of course, she no. goes up to Tony, too. Sure. I mean, there was, there was a little bit of talk at one point about would she be brought over? I mean, I don't think the producers ever thought of not bringing her, really. But there was a little vulnerability at one point, you know. And there was some talk about, well, nobody knows who she is, John. And I said, yeah, they don't now. But you <laughs> just give it three months and they'll know who she is. I said, so, you know, get your, get somebody famous for Shug Avery. That I, I can deal with that. And actually, I, I loved the woman who played that part, Jennifer Hudson, Heather Headley, who is a goddess. And uh, and Jennifer Holiday, all of whom played that role, they were the sort of name in the in the early part of the run. But I knew that I can remember the day I auditioned Cynthia, and um, it was a wet Thursday afternoon. I'd never heard of her. She had a career, a perfectly good career, but it wasn't stellar. You know, I mean, she wasn't created, she wasn't originating roles on the West End or anything. And she sang, and I thought, oh my god, this is extraordinary. And she had the physique that I thought was right. I think what was challenging for both she and I, but particularly for myself, uh, when it came, when we did it in London, you know, the attitude, the attitudes to race, the questions about race are very different to the question, you know, they're very different. And uh, so the, 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 the London company was made up of, you know, Africa, you know, there are no African Americans in Britain, right? They're either they're African or they were Jamaican or they were German or French or whatever. It was made up of a whole cross section of people. But she and I came over to do it here, and I was worried about doing it here. I, I felt, I felt as a white man, 
this was not a good idea at that particular time. And then for her, she was playing this iconic um, African-American role. Well, she's gone on to play others, of course, since, but um, that as a British girl, as a girl from, you know, East London. So it was, it was something, it was challenging. We were incredibly uh, uh, welcomed is the wrong word, embraced by the African-American community of actors who made the show. It was a, a, of, of the five Broadway shows I've done, and they've all been special. You know, working with Cheetah Rivera doesn't get any more special than that. But, but co the Color Purple was a, an honor. I mean, it really was an honor, uh, an honor well, to, to do that piece. I, John, I, I, I don't know if I told you this before, I took my wife uh, for her 50th birthday to New York to see three shows. And we saw The Color Purple first. And then the next night we were gonna see Hamilton with Lynn in his last week before he left the show. And I, I've had one experience in the theater where I couldn't move at the end of the first act. And that ironically was Jennifer Holliday in Dreamgirls when yeah. she sang, I'm telling you. And I was 19 and I had tears running down my face and I was glued to my chair. I had the same, I was affected the exact same way when I saw Color Purple. And while I admired Hamilton and I thought it was a brilliant piece of sort of portrait theater and stuff, the, the emotional place that I hit in Color Purple with her performance, but the whole production, I saw Heather, who I'd known from Aida, was extraordinary. Yes. Yeah. You know, also that, that same response happened all over America, I mean, it toured for two years, and everywhere it went, by this point, Cynthia wasn't in it, it got the same response. And it was so interesting, Patrick, because we'd done it in London at the Chocolate Factory, which is another tiny theater. Uh, I designed the set as well as directing it. It, it. it was successful there. It got good reviews. I mean, Ben Brantley really is who brought us to New York because he came and saw it there and loved it. Um, but it got good reviews and all of those things. It was very nice. But, and, and I knew it was good. You know, you know yourself if you're making good work or bad work. It was good work. Then we came to do it in America. And I thought, working with those actors, I thought, oh, no, this is a whole other ballgame. And then when we left, because they can sing, dear God. <laughs> when we left that rehearsal room, I thought, well, I think we might be okay here. I had no idea until I saw it in front of an American audience what we'd made. The audience told me what we'd made. It was like church. It was like good church. You know, the, and, and you had that whole panoply of audience, black, white, um, uh, male, female, Jewish, gay. It doesn't matter. Non-believers, they would put their hands up in the air at the end as if they were praising the Lord. You thought, my goodness me, the this is this is American theater. It's a powerful, powerful thing. It was well, an amazing experience. Well, let, let us let us show um, uh, John Doyle's The Color Purple, Cynthia Erivo. Watch this. Two or three weeks already. But when we go back into rehearsal, we're going to start all over again. Because the world is a different world. You know, we, our, our world has been arrested. It's been stopped. Um, but I, I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep that company of actors together. They're all committed to doing it again, you know, um, and uh, we've kept very closely in touch. And um, so I put uh, in the process, as you know, of putting together this event. It's a fundraising event, but it's it's putting together the three companies: your company, the original the Broadway company and this company and having different uh, different units of actors in conversation with each other or people singing bits of it that uh, they maybe didn't sing or, uh, for example, the three squeaky frooms and the three uh, Hinkleys are all singing um, Unworthy of Your Love together. Um, and then it leads to Stephen John. It's, it's edited. I mean, it, you know, it's made as a one hour kind of program really. Um, with editors, some of it's been filmed in the theater, um, but not with the company, but still using the empty theater as a sort of background for the storytelling, a theater, a theater that's waiting, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had 
we there it is. There it is. There it is. I hope people will uh, subscribe. April fifteenth, uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, at, at eight o'clock that Thursday. Oh, it's it looks great. Well, you know, I I I, I got to do a little piece of it too, which was which you certainly was, did. Thank you. You know, um, so what a great time. it's to raise money for. It's for really your, for the theater, like you. You know, I mean. I didn't come into the theater to be a fundraiser. I came in to be a director. Uh, but the last year we've all been trying to survive and never has never have Tennessee Williams, the words about the kindness of strangers been more true. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, it, it, it's, a, it's complicated, isn't it? You know, you know, as well as I do, that, I mean, this, this leading classic stage, which is wonderful. It's a wonderful space. It's a great company. It's 50 something years old. But this is the first time that I've led a, a company in a country that doesn't really fund the arts, right? I mean, in Great Britain, we have a, you know, all of the companies that I ever was artistic director of had more than 50% of their income from the government. Mm -hmm. So this is an this this not for profit thing, which I'm not sure is true in a country that celebrates profit. I'm not really convinced by this. <laughs> um, uh, it's 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 a bit of an odd one for me. I I keep trying to come to terms with it, but uh, you know I'm I'm always also amazed by people's generosity in America and by the real belief in philanthropy, which you don't get so much in the European countries. It's a different it's a different mindset. Um, like you, I'm sure, you know, we have a board who have hung on in there with us and it's hard. It's, it's very God, hard. God bless them. They have God been bless them. And the community too. I mean, for us, you know, here in Franklin and it's, it's the community getting together and supporting what the theater is and how much the theater brings to the community. That's right. It's a wonderful um, thing. It's One, a wonderful thing. I, I, I want, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say, you know, also something I think that's been rather moving is that every Friday at four o'clock on a Friday, it's a little bit like a therapy session, but we have a Zoom call with all the artistic directors of, of the not-for-profit companies in the city. Do the same thing. And, you know, people that I would never otherwise have met. I've often said on these things, oh, it took a pandemic for us to speak to each other. How extraordinary is this? John, you and I have been living the exact same life. I actually think that the pandemic was a huge feather in Patrick Cassidy's cap because Paul Vasterling at the Nashville Ballet is my best friend. Jennifer right. Turner at TPAC is my best friend. Yeah. Vogel at the at Nashville Rep. Barry Beasley, who runs the Franklin Theater here. Yeah. I, they become my friends this would have never happened that's right had the pandemic not happened that's and right. as a result it it will actually fuse the arts community here as one yeah you know which brings it to middle tennessee no i i am so grateful for that that piece and, and i had monday monday zoom calls with all of them <laughs> i want to have a i want to have a little fun i want to bring back our um our musical director patrick thomas who is an incredible musician there he is patrick seal of john doyle Hi, Patrick. So uh, I'm going to have I, – I, I have you here, John, and you love actors and you love singers and you love musicians. So Patrick has a little mock-up audition here for you. No, it's uh, – I, I wanted to play this because because of what you do and because of how you – I don't know how well you can hear me right now, but because of how you, you talk about reinventing things. And I had the chance to reinvent something of my own a while back. It was a Hank Williams song. And so Hank was always news about all over town. And I wanted to do it as I would do it. Um, as a guy that grew up listening to Jerry Lee Lewis and loving these piano players, Ray Charles, like you're saying. Yeah. So yeah. Was just, I was just a real short clip. Can you, can you hear him, John? Do you hear him? I Great. can. Sound all over town. You may see I'm running around. I know that I, I should leave the place. You know I just can't. Oh, 
<laughs> I tell you, lasso a director on and make him get him on a job. <laughs> you know, when, I, when I audition actor musicians, um, I always feel sorry. The, the ones who get most nervous are the piano players. It's really interesting. You would think the string players would, but they don't. I think there's something about playing the piano in a room of people being silent. It's just an extraordinary thing, really. Well done, you. Thanks. Thank Pat. you. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks so much. Thank you, John, for indulging us. Um, <laughs> tell me uh, about, give me, give me one piece of advice, because you've been an artistic director for so many companies and now an incredible company in New York. Give me the best piece of advice you could give this 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 artistic director. Um, somehow to find the facility to go to sleep at night and not think about it. Mm. And it's hard, I think. For me, it's it I watch, it's hard. I watch the tennis channel or something like that. I I I've never lost a night's sleep over the theater in my life. I've lost it over other things, but I've never lost a night's sleep over the theater. And I think, I don't know if that's just my Protestant work ethic about I go to work, I do my job, and then I go home and I forget about it, but I have got that facility. And I think that's, that's what's done it for me. And I think, and something I've learned over the years more and more and more is that my job is in an ideal world, and I think people respect this too in time, my job as a director in a rehearsal room and even as a leader of a company is to ask questions, not to have all the answers, but to have the questions. And ideally, to ask questions to which I don't know the answer so that you are enabling the other person. That is perfect advice. Thank you so much. Miles Aubrey says, hi, Mr. Doyle, loving this interview. I'm one of those actor musicians who've given a lot of employment to was in Jersey Boys for four years and was brought in for several of your shows in New York City, once company, Pump Boys, hoping to get back in the room for you one of these years. That would be nice. Very nice, Miles. Um, you are you're extraordinary, John. Oh, thank you, John Doyle. So, thank you, Patrick Cassie. I need this after a long day working at the hospital. Oh, that's, thank you so much. Uh, oh, that's, thank you. Real, that's real work. That's what yes. you is real work. Um, we do a, I think I told you, Briefly in our little tech, so we do another. We do a game on this show. Oh, by the way, John, we do another game on this show called "Remember the Lyric," where I, where I literally, t I, I wasn't going to do it to you because you're a director, but I, I give a lyric of a song they sang from a show they sang in, and they have to come back with me the lyric. And I've sung "If I Loved You" with Kelly O'Hara. I've sung "I Got Life from Here" with Treat Williams. I've sung "The Confrontation in Les Mis" with Norm Lewis. It's been a wonder for me, but yeah. for you. We play a game called You Become the Host. So you get to ask me one question, any question, and go. Okay. Well, you asked me about where it began for me. So I know, obviously, uh, not obviously, but I know that you come from a family of artists, right? Your mom is a highly respected, hugely talented woman, and you were raised in a, in a family of music makers and singers, was that, when you started, was that a help or a hindrance? Oh, it's a great question. And it was both. It was, it was a help in the sense that I could get an agent. The t in fact, at the time, it was William Morris, which was the top agency, mm -hmm. them and ICM, uh, by the mere fact that my last name was spelled C-A-S-S-I-D-Y. Mm -hmm. uh, it had nothing to do if I had any talent. It had nothing to do if I could even sing. I mean, I was fortunate. I was a, a drummer and I could sing. Um, but it, but that was the help. They, I had any agent, any manager, anybody. I, I, and I had big record companies. Um, Robert Stigwood from RSO and, 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 and Mike, uh, Mike Kerb over at Warner Brothers. They wanted to sign me, you know, song un, unheard just based on the fact that they thought I, you know, because of my name. Where it hurt me was being taken seriously. Yeah. They, both my brothers who were huge pop stars, um, that's what they compared me to. They didn't compare me to my father, Jack Cassidy, who had had a renowned Broadway, you know, Absolutely. Tony Award winner. And then of course my mother did all the musical movies and Academy Award winner and all that. They didn't think of me like that. They thought of me in that, in that, in that sort of line of T 
teen idols, yeah. and which I made a choice to go the theater way. I, mm -hmm. I moved to New York when I was 18. I got into class. I got cast in Pirates of Penzance. And then I just started working from there. Um, so the first 10 years, it was, it was about proving that I could live up to the name. Yeah. And, and, and that's what it was. But, yeah. uh, but, you know, the influence around the house of course. and the things not to do, that was all a huge benefit. And of still course. Is. Of still course. Is. Of course. Um, you are extraordinary, my friend. You are, uh, I am, I am, I'm humbled to be around you. It's so great to meet you and to get to talk to you. This Assassin's Project that we've both uh, shared in common uh, is everything uh, to me. I, I'm telling our audience, please watch on April 15th. Support a Classic Stage Company. They are an incredible company uh, uh, headed by Mr. John Doyle. That is an incredible cast, as he said. Uh, and it's on April 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make a donation to them. Make a donation to us. But make a donation for Tell the Story, celebrating Stephen Sondheim and John Wyman's assassins. You're a joy, John. Absolutely. Patrick. I thank Take you. Care. Thank you. All right. And uh, I can't wait to see the show on April 15th. Keep your chin up. I, will. I know. All right, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's our show for tonight. Uh, did you guys like that out there? That was that was a that was that was a great show. He's a, he's an extraordinary man. Uh, again, by clicking and on the donate button above, or by messaging STT to two zero two eight five eight one two three three. Please make that donation. We also love uh, Facebook stars, and um, and we are here. And uh, I want to bring Patrick Thomas back for a second. Can we? Jump him back on the screen. There you are. How'd you have fun, Patrick? What did you think of John Doyle? Amazing, right? I, I, I wish I didn't know that. It was, I feel like it was one of the most, we've done a lot of these, every guest is incredible, but it was really one of the most in, insightful, um, useful, uh, whatever word you want, want to use, but for me, I mean, just uh, personally inspiring interview I've heard. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, he's extraordinary and uh, and such, such a pleasure to have him. And you did great too, Mr. Do we have a, a goodbye song? Do you have something you can sing goodbye here for? To our audience, a, good, a goodbye song. Goodbye, everyone. I'm the pop song guy. I sing all the uh, bye bye love. You did that one. Bye bye, bye, bye happiness. Hello loneliness. I think bye, I'm gonna bye, cry. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.